it's really great to have Kurt here from New York because it's bringing everyone out that hasn't been here in a while. I'm very excited by that. Um, where's the bus? Ken sold it. The neighbors, I guess, got, didn't like you know, poetry in motion. She She did. She had reasons. I'm sure she did, but it was great fun, and I'm glad we experienced it together. Um, and I'm glad Kurt is here. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Kurt, where'd he go? Oh, there he is. <laughs> um, Kurt Heil is a native of Chicago, but he's been living in Brooklyn for the last eight years, uh, interspersed with his life in California and New Mexico. And he tells us it's, it's odd to think that music was where I started. I don't find that odd at all. No, okay. No! Music is poetry. Poetry is music. It's all intertwined in my brain. Um, at 12 uh, years old, he began to study and play the trombone, my, one of my favorite instruments, because um, it's written in the tenor clef, and that's where I sing. I love that. Um, his whole social world revolved around music all the way through high school and finally with a scholarship to Quincy College. His younger brother Bob was a trumpet player and his sister Jayanne, the youngest, also played trombone for a while. In fact, his earliest recollections are of his, his father singing to him during baths. From the age of two on, his dad was in charge of giving him baths. He knew all the lyrics by heart, and he repeated the songs often enough that I learned them all so we could sing them together. Then when we went on vacations, we would all sing in the car. I went through the same thing. I will be able to sing Sweet Betsy from Pike forever. I will then, um, and it, after more than 50 years, he still knows all the lyrics to his father's favorite songs. He is also an artist, a writer, and a poet, like several of us here. And uh, tonight he's going to read several selections from his new collection of poems, What the Heart Sees. Uh, Kirk tells us that the intention of his poetic contribution is to follow a thread of thought uh, that appears in early Sanskrit writing of Indian philosophy and continues to develop into Buddhism. Specifically, hi, nice to see you. Specifically in Zen Buddhism. From the 10th century BC, before Buddhism, Lao Tzu, Confucius, and well before Christ comes the hymn of creation. Hymn number 120 from the Rig Veda. Um, Kurt, um, as I've told you, was also a part of our poetic opening tour, and I am so happy to welcome him back, Mr. Kurt Hyatt. Thank you, thank you, Jim Nistram. Okay, I, of course I can't compete with Charcel oh. and Charcel's voice, so I'll just do the best I can. Um, Your voice is perfect. For thank you, you, thank you. Close enough to just get closer to the mic, that's the secret. Um, okay, I was the videographer for the poetry tour and the co pilot. And that's my claim to fame. Um, I've been in and out of poetry since a teenager. I memorized T.S. Eliot's poem, The Love Song for Jail for Prufrock, in order to um, rid myself of my Chicago dialect. Because <laughs> I got tired of flat A's. And um, so it worked, it worked, it was worked. So, it was a good thing to do, it turned out. Okay, here goes. This, move, this poem is called First Morning. 
The rays of morning light just miss my head as they begin to light up the house. As I look at these beams of light, I see billions of dust particles floating in the air. And I am reminded of the stars last night on a moonless clear night, a billion stars floating in the sky. I am writing this morning because the specks of floating light remind me of the sacred that dwells in the details of the day so often missed. And this next poem is called Frost, Not Robber. <laughs> birds own the morning. Everywhere you look, birds are sitting on tops of the trees, but the banquet seems to be here on the roof above me. They come for the frost to drink, to play on our metal roof that sparkles in the dawning light, white and inviting. You can hear them pecking up there and see, constant, see a constant flurry of wings darting about, racing one another for fun. So many birds that they now own this house I built, and I am a witness sitting inside their bird bath. <laughs> Thank you. This next poem is called Labyrinth of Letters and was written for my friend Ken Dickinson. A constant search for a constant search for something that lies within the words on the page. Something that touches deep within him from many, from many different directions at once. The heart, the funny bone, the head, but always releasing the grasp, letting the poems sing their own songs. After letting go, he spreads out the words for friends and an ever-widening world of worlds, spiraling out of time. We use our words to intimate meaning because we can only circumscribe the sacred and never hold it, only be held by it. This next poem is called Grandchildren for My Loving Wife Maureen. She's over here. So it's the symmetry, the symmetry of the reading. How can I write about this noise that seems unending as the war between Batman and Joker has taken over my room? <laughs> What's there to understand? The things of the child will not be put away for many years. So I voluntarily offer up my thermorest as a bouncing mat so that Batman can fly. In fact, everyone is flying around here. And what may look and sound like war is only fascination with gravity and its limitations. Both of us are fascinated with magnets. How the same two pieces of metal can at one time jump towards one another and then completely refuse to touch in the next moment. Sometimes I act like that with the greatest love of my life. It's more than beyond reason, it's beyond what I thought love was. So I watch these impulses surge within and try not to let them manifest so that no one knows about these wild internal swings that bounce me about like Batman on a thermorest. <laughs> this next poem is dedicated to both Fernando Rangis and Trudy Richards, who happens to be here tonight. It's called Being. Let's talk about being. What is it? Can you put your finger on it? A 
Ontology is the study of being, so it must be something. Being is a noun according to everything we know. And from Wikipedia, being is an extremely broad concept encompassing subjective and objective features of reality and existence. Anything that partakes in being is called a dot dot dot. <laughs> but from the point of view of CELO and a phenomenological reduction of thinking, being is and is. It is not an object, nor can it be an object, nor can it be an object of study or a noun, since it is not a concept, since it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist unless it is. There is no being without manifestation, footnote one. So if it is not manifesting, it doesn't exist since it's not out there, not a thing, but an experience which is recognized in its elapsing, being is and is. Footnote one is from Principles of Thought by Silo, cited in Jorge Pompey's book, The Structural Dynamic Method. Next poem is called Face the Wall. Who stands there? Where are you going? I can't move forward. Is there room behind you? Yes, but I'm concerned with the future. What about the present? The wall is my present. Could you be your own present? How could I be that? Ask yourself. Okay, I see I am not the wall. The wall only blocks my body. I am free to move inside once I can leave thought behind. The wall no longer matters, and from my heart I remember love. Life is lighter, I can move with ease, the wall reappears as that which is because I am friends with myself and the wall. Now I feel the future is already here and nothing, and the wall blocks nothing. Now we're going to stay within nothing. This is a, called a poem about nothing. Nothing is real important. Real, real important. A poem about nothing. As T.S. Eliot predicted in his quartets, I have searched and searched my whole life, and in the end, I found what I've already had all along, nothing. This burning need to know has finally revealed what my life search has discovered, nothing. Not only can I not hold this void I've uncovered, but there is nothing there to hold. A life's work ends here with nothing. This may sound bad, but it's not. It's like coming to an open space after years in a dense jungle. Everything opens up, my head clears, and it is empty. I am certain about not knowing. Everything falls into place in that void which opens to include the universe. Thank you. I'll blush. I'm serious, I do. I'm blushing. It's a nice color. Yeah, thank you. Okay, someone else's Elliot for Bruce Renner. I saw it at a library sale packed in the poetry section. Even though I had my own copy at home in Brooklyn, it was hard to pass up, but I did. 
I didn't take it because I thought it would be good to share T.S. with others less fortunate that didn't have his collected poems. I always felt that underneath that stuffed shirt and pompous religiosity laid a searching soul not satisfied with the word as it was written, but reached past old forms like Rilke had done before him. Unlike Rilke, he quit in the middle of his life after completing his masterpiece of four. They were all there in that book I left behind, turning, turning Wednesday's stairs and rolled trousers on the beach. What I recognized in Elliot as a teenager was a forward push past rhyme and rhythm into a new open space that also opened me. How that space remains here and there in my memory and in the middle of the 20th century dragged along as a breakthrough into a new moment. How a book becomes an icon, an impulse that remains as a search for that which breaks through the knowing. This poem is called Illogical. While looking for my purpose, a principle occurs to me. If you pursue an end, you enchain yourself to suffering. If, if, but, if you, but if everything is done as though it were an end in itself, you liberate yourself. Then my purpose cannot be anywhere but here. I'm not going towards my purpose because then it would be somewhere other than here. And this is not possible if I am to become liberated. I must look for it here and it must exist in my present. So I need a different present from my usual. I need a present that includes my life as a road already traveled, but includes it as a profound joy. How can my life be a profound joy? I need to see it differently. I need to let go of a lot. Letting go of who I thought I was, of who I think I am, letting go of competition and discrimination, letting go of hurts and injustice so I can love this reality I am in and see my life as a gift I've been given for a moment, a moment that is now. This next poem was written out of loss. Um, I, was, I was lost. And um, so the only thing I could think to do was to bang on the typewriter. Just bang and 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 bang. And then after I had gotten more or less 100 letters on the page, I looked at them and I found two words, sort of. One word and one sort of word. And it was get high diddy. And so that's the, the poem. That's get. the title of the poem. Get, get, get high diddy. I did it. Yeah. It's not a word, but it was the closest thing I could find <laughs> to a word. Playing with randomness on the keyboard, I search for something recognizable which I can use as a jumping off point. You have to start somewhere, so I've chosen this place and this time to begin with Get High Diddy. What is this thought? What is behind this urge to write? I use words as approximations to get around language altogether, to distill from randomness the inexplicable. 
How will it be? How will this be? Entropy descends while life ascends. Yet underneath all matter there exists, there remain, underneath all matter that exists, there remains something else that also ascends and whose source is inside the human heart. It gives birth to God and religion, to philosophy and mysticism, but it goes much further and reaches beyond the universe. Beyond death and language, it hints, its hints are felt deep inside as a whisper one can't quite hear, as if there was a light there, a glowing of the heart. I'd like to end with a poem called Writing Poems. I think the thing is when I when I the thing is when I am lost and there are no trees or bushes to ask. I am lost outside of time and space, which may sound strange, but it feels just empty. I too am empty. I begin scratching around with words trying to find myself, trying to find where I am so I can work my way back. No, not back, but out into openness. Like opening the hand to let go, the words come slowly and I watch carefully as they open me on the page before me. This is how the writing has worked, finding itself from nowhere to openness. I don't know where I'm going when I begin. I am too lost to even know I'm lost. I can only begin. Often that beginning is writing about beginning. I am not sure-footed. I stumble around bumping into words, hoping they are going somewhere. In some ways, it's like a spiral that slowly rises out of this void and slowly begins to notice itself. It's as if I am the last to see, and when I do, the poem is done. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Wonderful. You did fabulous. Thank you. Is that a machine yeah, here? No, it's just a mic. Oh, okay. That that was wonderful. I let's say give it up for sure. It's a hard thing to feature if you've never done it. And I would love for people to come talk to me who want to give it a try. You know, um, it's, it's wonderful when we get to explore someone's inner self like that. It means a lot. So I had no idea about the theme, um, but this kind of fits. It's about an experience with someone who I believe is quite free and my own opposite experience at the same time. <clears throat> Afloat in the great love for all that exists, the master stares at me with delight and puzzled curiosity while I shrink and babble, trying to explain why I am here, cowering in his joyful blaze. I would kill myself if I weren't the center of the world. All the while, he gazes at my confusion, smiling at something inside me I cannot see. Oh, 
And this one also is kind of a little bit about freedom from another point of view. It's called Falling Into Play. I was remembering playing as a child and, and looking at children playing. So, Inventing inner worlds, we follow each other in the curious children's wonder dance, twirling like seeds in the wind and ending up surprised at the bottom of a chute in a bed of lilies, reborn. Oh. And this one is um, <laughs> definitely about freedom. It's really amazing. Um, it came out of a few lines from my journal that I was reading today, and then I, they developed into this long thing, which is my last poem. It's called Conundrum. The one who knew what was going on pointed out the obvious. Life is nothing but permanent enchainment. One thing to another. One thought to another. One feeling to another. One action to another. The way the wall is connected to the roof and the floor, which are connected to the ground and the air. And I am connected to you and you to me. And even if you die and disappear, I am connected to you and you to me by the spider silk of memory. And there's nowhere to go and nowhere to hide. And then he said, take a look inside. See if you can see the permanent form in action. See if you can see that which is not movement form. See if you can see that what is and what is not are the same. And finally, see if you can see in one and all the same. So I looked at the world, at the million things and thoughts and feelings and deeds, buzzing and flying and floating, squeaking and frothing, churning and rushing, each one apparently its own separate self, yet inexorably stuck to everything else, and said, impossible. But that was totally unsatisfactory. So I took a breath and looked again, looked into my heart, and for a moment saw that the permanent form in action is love. That what is not movement form is love. That what is and what is not is love. That in one and all is love. But that was yesterday when my little eye was not looking. Today, again, I am blind. And so I ask, may we all be steeped in love. May love be distilled in our hearts. May we live, eat, breathe, sleep, think, feel, and act in love. May everything we do be love. May the little eye swoon away in the unbearable sweetness of love. May love be all. Oh, yeah. Wonderful, Trudy. Thank you.